and welcome everyone to our December Tech Talk. We are excited to have Dr. Mustafa Uskainak from University of Colorado of Denver to talk to us about his research on workflow analysis in health systems. Before I introduce our speaker, let me go over some housekeeping issues. We will continue extending CME credits for our Tech Talks and ID series presentations. We will distribute the information via email to those who registered for today's event. If you did not register prior to today's talk, you can still obtain CME code information from Deborah Reese at Christiana Care. Her email is deborah.reese at christianacare.org, and it's also in the chat. We have very exciting presentations coming up. Next week, we have Drs. Kutoli and Hashimonji from Nemours, and their presentations is an ID series. They're going to talk to us about homelessness in high school 2019 youth risk behavior surveillance system data. On January 6, 2022, we have a tech talk, Dr. Rich Brown from University of Delaware, and his presentation is Mathematical Modeling and Data Science Methods in Dynamics of the Tear Film on the Ice Surface. On January 13, 2022, we have an ID series presentations from Dr. Craig Pollack, Johns Hopkins, and he's going to talk to us about housing policy, neighborhood context, and health. Now, I would like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Mustafa Oskanak. Dr. Oskanak is an associate professor in University of Colorado Denver College of Nursing. Before joining University of Colorado, he was a postdoctoral fellow at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. He has earned his master's and PhD in industrial and system engineering from University of Wisconsin-Madison. Dr. Oskanek has been a PI or co-investigator on multiple federal grants, including the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. He has a long list of peer-reviewed publications and book chapters and national and international presentations. He's a teacher, a mentor, and I'm also very lucky to have him as my mentor. So without further delay, Dr. Oskanek, please take it over. Thank you very much, Mina, for a nice uh, presentation. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Perfect. So, I'm so excited to be part of uh, this uh, Tech Talk series. Today, I would like to talk about um, workflow and uh, how and why we analyze workflow. So, the workflow um, is very key concept in systems engineering, um, dissemination and implementation science, um, organizational behavior, and in many bunch of disciplines, we uh, work workflow it becomes a very uh, central concept. And let me uh, first describe what the workflow is. So the, I bring here three different definitions. The first definition highlights flow workflow as a flow of work through space and time so let me let me give you an example from emergency departments uh, at very highest level what happens in emergency department is that a patient arrives typic typically goes to a triage room and then from triage room goes back to waiting room and then when it is patient's time is taken to a patient room and then discharge and this all happens uh, within a time frame let's say four hours five hours six hours etc so the second uh, the definition of workflow here it says it's a representation of activities roles and sequences for a single patient care episode uh, this definition highlights again three main uh, building blocks of workflow activities so what happens in what happens to the patient in emergency department roles so who who is involved like um, providers nurses uh, technicians and admin person and also highlights importance of sequence so the so the things happen in a in an order not necessarily fixed for every patient but there is a kind of an order and the third definition also highlights ordering and it says it's predefined set of work steps and partial ordering of these steps so the, this uh, definition also highlights there is a set of activities going on in workflow 
So they are ordered, but not necessarily it's a rigid order. So in practice, we use workflow as a modeling tool. So basically, it's um, so we use workflow to represent a complex work or work practice simple way. For example, if you ask an ED clinician, tell me about ED work, this person can talk about hours and hours about what happens in the emergency department. But we use workflow to simplify, and of course we uh, eliminate a lot of details, but eventually we keep what is essential in emergency department, and then we only, workflow includes only essentials to explain complex work simple way. That's why we uh, use workflow uh, most of the time in practice. And uh, because of this simplicity, it allows comprehension and cooperation. And uh, typically, again, workflow highlights temporal features. So we are fortunate to uh, able to use a lot of different um, conceptual frameworks to study workflow. And uh, I like to highlight some of the multi-level perspe perspectives on workflow. So the multi-level means, so when we look at like an organization, we see, t we may be able to see multiple levels. For example, um, the first categorization here, it's, it starts with cognitive workflow. So it is like the lowest level. And then it goes to individual workflow, organizational workflow, and inter-organizational workflow. And uh, it becomes, it uh, includes more and more, um, like the scope becomes broader and broader. But as we go further, uh, we usually lose uh, some details. So that's the trade-off here. So the, when we look at the cognitive workflow, we can see many more details, but as we go forward and let's say come to the interorganizational workflow, we have broader scope, but uh, most of the time less details. So the uh, Carayon also uh, suggested um, similar categorization like interorganization, clinic level workflow, intravisit workflow, or cognitive workflow. So there are a bunch of different way to uh, label dif these different levels. For example, Unertel et al. suggested a pervasive level and specific level. Per pervasive level is interested in context. So what is going on uh, around the workflow and the specific level includes uh, uh, building blocks of workflow, for example, uh, activities and pe people and uh, uh, temporal components. And the Malhotra suggests that we can study individual workflows and we can bring them together to understand what is going on in the uh, in, at the higher level. So that that's kind of another perspective. So why do we analyze workflow? So the uh, I identified two main motivations to analyze workflow. First, we study workflow to identify like bottlenecks, waste, and inefficiencies. So the, how can we make an organization unit or team more efficient, more productive? So the, that's the one motivation to study workflow. Another motivation which is more relevant to uh, my research and uh, what I'm about to talk is workflow can workflow studies can inform the development of systematic organizational interventions. And these interventions can be technology interventions, facility layout, policy changes, staffing, etc. So the uh, many organizational interventions can benefit from uh, workflow studies. My research here falls in mostly technology-related interventions, and all the examples will be related to more uh, technology interventions uh, from now on. So let me tell you more about how workflow can support 
technology interventions in organizations. So here is consider this as a very simple timeline that shows intervention development. So the first we design the intervention and then implementation and evaluation. And literature includes a lot of studies that is uh, that suggests conducting workflow studies at least three points within this timeline. So first we can examine workflow even before we design our intervention. So this is important because when we design our technology, this can be barcoding technology, this can be any mobile technology, this can be, let's say, order sets within um, EHR or clinical decision support systems. We want to make sure that our intervention, our technology is not going to disrupt disturb ongoing uh, workflow. So we need to be design something congruent to or fits well to existing workflow. So the, that requires studying workflow before we do the design so that whatever we observe or collect data about leads us to a technology design that is that fits well to ongoing work practice. So, but the, the reality is that we design something that is congruent or that fits well to the ongoing work practice. It, we need to revise the workflow to some extent. So the technology, is not only technology intervention in most of the cases, so it requires us to uh, make changes in how people work. So in this case, the second time when we analyze workflow is when we redesign it after we, uh, we design our intervention. And then we implement our intervention, and then after a while we um, we, we need to evaluate our intervention. At this point, workflow evaluation becomes a useful part of the whole evaluation effort. So, the keyword in the first workflow analysis here before the design is congruence. And in the second, the keyword for the second analysis effort is to optimize. So, we want to optimize workflow to fit perfectly with our intervention. And then we uh, evaluate the workflow at the end along with the intervention. So I like to make an important distinction here about like the uh, workflow that we may be studying. So what do we really study? So the distinction here is that are we studying designed workflow, what should it be, what do we, what, what do people are, what are some people supposed to work, or are we looking at actual workflow? So the, the literature is full of studies that shows people do not necessarily work how they are supposed to work in clinical settings. So the, there is a, there, there might be some differences between how work was designed but, and how work is actually performed in clinical settings. And the, even uh, things that make uh, this more complicated, uh, how people perceive workflow may be different than how workflow actually is in clinical settings. So the, again, design workflow, how it was um, planned at the first place, how it actually it happens in clinical settings, and then how, how do people think what workflow is? These three may be different from each other. There is important methodological implications here because the methods we use uh, most of the time uh, impose what we really study.
So, uh, I like to categorize workflow methods into two. Capturing, so the methods related to capturing and the methods related to analysis. So the capturing methods may be observations, interview studies, work sampling, using EHR sensors, etc. And the analysis methods can be categorized into three as like rich qualitative descriptions, quantitative analysis, and visual representations. So I, you see some of them are blue here because next slides, I'm gonna present four cases in which we conducted workflow studies and uh, I'm, I, I will try to provide some examples of these blue uh, methods uh, next uh, uh, like the uh, 20 minutes or so. So the four cases, so the first case is about a time and motion study to analyze workflow in emergency departments. The second case is about using electronic health records, uh, health record logs to analyze workflow in emergency departments. The third one is qualitative study, it's a qualitative study to analyze workflow in nursing homes. And the, the last study is uh, using the idea of workflow to understand routines at home. So the, how can we understand daily routines at home using the idea of workflow? So the first two cases, uh, they took place in emergency departments. The third one is in nursing homes. And the fourth one is uh, home, home environment, like daily living environment. So the uh, first study, uh, again, we look at a workflow in a pediatric emergency department and the motivation here was to, so we did this before implement, uh, designing the technology intervention and the technology was here a clinical decision support uh, system. So it's an order set embedded in emergency department and uh, to prevent uh, over prescription of uh, antibiotics. So again, this study was conducted in a single uh, tertiary care academic uh, ED, children's ED. And uh, we observed here four roles, four different type of providers over three months using a tablet computer-based data collection tool. So the uh, observers, and uh, we always use two observers at a time, so that they went to uh, emergency department and then they used a tablet computer it, it, uh, includes a data collection tool it's an app uh, and then the, they they use this structured met, uh, tool to collect data on uh, workflow uh, but we also conducted some quick interviews to understand timing of diagnosis and the disposition uh, disposition decisions. So the, this is the demo uh, version of the, the data collection tool that we used. So the what happens is, uh, again, this demo was for more like a primary care uh, settings. So the, there are preset uh, acti activities here. So the, a lot of possible activities that might be conducted by different uh, roles in emergency department and the observers go there and as they observe an activity that fits in one of these uh, activities, they click and the, the, on the right here you see that the, this tool uh, record the clicks, uh, hence the uh, observe, observed activities. So, uh, I know this is impossible to read, but I just wanted to give here a flavor of uh, what type of analysis we conducted here. So the, uh, and at the, uh, I'll pro provide references at the end of the presentation. And uh, uh, if you are interested, uh, feel free to read the paper to better understand what is going on here. But the, here, what we see is that we look at some possible sequence of activities 
for different type of providers. Like this is for attending physicians. So the uh, some patterns for attending physicians. So this is the pattern for physician assistants. This is the pattern for nurse practitioners, and this is the pattern for residents. And then the, here we look at. So this is like the visually uh, highlighting the patterns, and the, this is we conducted some activities. Uh, I'm sorry, we uh, compare duration of activities across roles. So the, and we conducted on the right. Uh, statistical test and on the left it is the visualization and uh, um, when we look at visualization I think it is more or less clear how these people these roles operate differently so uh, we conducted observations which yield these findings but we also conducted some very quick Interview. So these are not really necessarily con like the uh, more uh, organized interviews. These are one question, quick props, I would say. So we ask 23 participants 110 times for this patient, at what point during her or his visit did you decide how to proceed with the treatment? So the, we wanted to know at what point the workflow these providers were making decisions about the treatment plan. And then uh, participants highlighted 21 different decision points throughout the, uh, throughout the workflow. But about half of uh, the like half of the responses was like the, they make how to uh, they make decision on the treatment plan after during examining or uh, talking to the patient or family. But again, there are a bunch of different, uh, like 21 to be exact, uh, distinct decision points in this uh, workflow. So, uh, what, what was the design and implementation recommendation here? So the clinical decision support, CDS, should support a variety of workflows because these four patient, I'm sorry, four roles, four clinicians, they might be providing care to similar patients, but they have different workflows. And also, clinical decision support should, supp uh, should support clinicians who, are, who may be making decisions in a different physical locations within ED. For example, uh, the most common decision point was when patient assessment was happened, but or they talked to the uh, family member, but this doesn't happen um, physician station. This happens in patient room. So we need to bring the decision support to patient room instead of just keeping it in the uh, physician station, which where uh, access to EHR is most of the time for these uh, clinicians. And also the uh, CDS should support decisions at uh, different point of, points of care. So the second study, again, we characterized a workflow in pediatric asthma, uh, pediatric emergency department, which happens to be same emergency department. But in this case, we used, we look at asthma patients and we got data from EHR. So for for a single year, we look at all the asthma care uh, in emergency department, and the, for each patient, we had a workflow. So the, this patient came, like, uh, let me show here. So the here, for example, this is a workflow for one patient. So the, as you see here, um, this patient came walk in, not ambulance and they came to main ED. So we collected uh, actually in the main ED as well as some satellite clinics, some community emergency departments as well. And the equity level here is three. And uh, when we look at uh, activities, so that these are the activities that we captured and this, this, is, the kind, this is the timeline of this patient. And uh, um, 
what was interesting here is that, so the very different than observations. So we have here very big sample size. So the we, when we, uh, so the observations are very labor intensive, but when we collect data from the EHR, then we, in a very short time of period, we can have data on thousands of patients, which was the case here. So the, again, um, we collected workflow related uh, from EHR for all the patients in a single year uh, with asthma diagnos diagnosis, and then we focus on uh, eight events. So the, the EHR collects data on a bunch of different events, but we only look at eight events that is also listed uh, here on the uh, right side. And then uh, we also collected data on mode of arrival, like whether they are walking or ambulance, or we also look at uh, their uh, triage score, which uh, represents equity level. And then the, uh, let me show our findings here. Okay, so the, this is uh, our deliverables after our analysis. So the, let me start with the matrix here. So the, this matrix, so because of the uh, the way how the, uh, it's developed, so it shows here nine uh, events, but actually the ninth one is dummy uh, dummy events. So the the first eight is the real events that we captured. So the we look at here the transitions from one event to other. How likely this, the next uh, event is one of these events here. So do we look at transition probabilities here for uh, for different situations. For example, this P1 matrix shows walk in patients uh, with acute level two, and the P2 matrix shows ambulance patients uh, with acute level two. And here we see it's their visual representation. So the, as we see here, uh, so the matrix is not great to see the differences between P1 and P2, but the uh, A and B pictures, A and B shows how walking and ambulance patients for the same diagnosis can be treated and same equity can be treated differently. And the, the red ones shows strong probabilities, uh, blue, shows um, not that much uh, strong probability. And uh, similarly, we have also matrix here. So this is acute level three, three uh, walking ambulance. So the, we see uh, these are also, there are some similarities as well as some differences between workflows uh, for the patients with different arrival mode or as well as different equity. And again, uh, for homogeneity, we look at only asthma patients so that they have the uh, same um, diagnosis. So what we observe here at the end is that uh, high amount of variation across the episodes and that highlights the importance of flexibility in ED care delivery. And we also uh, make the case that EHI can be rich data source for workflow research and it helps us quantifying workflow and the linking workflow to outcomes. So the, here is the main problem with the current state of the workflow research. So the workflow research is great for description. How about creating links of workflow to patient outcomes? That's, uh, I'll also talk a little bit about this in my future direction slide, but, um, that part is missing because of some, met most of because of some methodological problems that we can um, discuss later. But the, here, what we show is that we, uh, our data, because of the big sample size, and uh, again, thanks to EHRs that keep a lot of data for workflow research, allow us quantification of workflow. So we were able to create these matrices that represent the workflow. So the workflow typically, because of the qualitative data, mostly represented uh, like the descriptions or 
um, virtually, but if we have enough sample size, we can also quantify it and use much more rich uh, data analysis methods to analyze workflow. Here, what we were able to do that to show the value of quantification. So the, we, uh, we look at matrices for each emergency department. So the, here we collected data from the main ED as well as four satellite clinics. So the, we collected data from five different physical locations. And it turned out that uh, satellite clinic four was the one with the shortest length of stay, which is an important performance criteria for emergency departments. So basically, for satellite clinic four was the one with the shortest length of stay. And then when we look at dissimilarities workflow, dissimilarities in workflow for these five sites, we notice that as an emergency clinic becomes more dissimilar to satellite clinic four, it the length of stay gets higher, becomes higher. So that the, so the uh, satellite clinic four somehow came up with the uh, workflow that creates the shortest long, uh, length of stay. And uh, as workflow becomes more dissimilar, length of stay becomes longer. So the, we were, then we were able to show the relationship between workflow and length of stay. So uh, I think this is enough emergency departments and uh, let's talk about the workflow a little bit in nursing homes. And this is a very qualitative study, very different uh, analysis that we use here. So we characterize workflow in, in nursing homes and identified implications uh, of workflow for the development of clinical decision support system. Again, the motivation here was to um, inform a clinical decision support system that was being developed for nursing homes. And then we conducted a descriptive study at two uh, nursing homes in Colorado and we um, characterized clinical workflow uh, in nursing homes by conducting 18 observation sessions and interviewing 15 staff members. These are one hour long detailed interviews. Uh, we ask a bunch of questions. So the, this is a very typical qualitative study. So the, just to give a little bit background. So this is the uh, app we designed at that time. So the, we call it UTI Decide. So the, this was about help um, nurses in uh, nursing homes help with the diagnosis of UTI in nursing homes. So the UTI is very common in nursing homes and uh, it's over diagnosed. Like the sometimes uh, no, uh, a client may not be UTI, but it is diagnosed as UTI and then starts, they start antibiotic, which may uh, create some harm at the end. So the, the, uh, this UTI Decide app has two functions. One function is if the symptoms, so the nurse is supposed to enter symptoms here, and this uh, using some uh, guidelines. So the, this app warns the user if this patient can be something other than UTI. So the, that helps uh, nurse to consider other diagnosis. And also this app is supposed to produce some outcomes like this to better or more comprehensive uh, reporting of findings about the client to physician. So the nursing homes, the interesting thing is um, there's a uh, there's rarely a physician in house, so the physicians are located remotely, and the nurses are supposed to communicate with them mostly through phone to communicate nurse uh, I'm sorry client problems and then uh, get um, instructions from provider. So we look at workflow in nursing homes at four different levels. 
individual, group, organization, and industry levels. Workflow at individual level. So the two obvious tasks conducted by nurses and the CNA, so the CNA stands for Certified Nurse Assistant, so that they are helpers for nurses. So that their scope of practice is much um, narrower than nurses. So the typical task nurses conduct is medication management. So the, these patients typically they, uh, they are on multiple medications that needs to be managed and that's nurses task. CNAs, they are more in charge of activities of daily living because these clients, they have their abilities varies in terms of ability to conduct activities of daily living. So these two activities were obvious, but what our observations revealed is that some latent activities which are very critical for the management of uh, care uh, of the clients in nursing homes. So the most important one is establishing baseline for residents. So the, this means, so the, they need to, so the understanding change of condition for clients in nursing home is very important to be to, un, to uh, detect uh, or uh, to detect uh, necessity for some intervention, so some treatment. So for example, for UTI, one of the symptoms is confusion. So the nurses are expected to know their clients or the residents of nursing home, their baseline confusion level because if they don't know their baseline confusion level, they may not detect the change in confusion because sometimes some clients, they already have confusion. Having a confusion is, is doesn't mean anything because what we are looking at for UTI diagnosis is increasing confusion. So the, it's similarly changes in, for example, sleep patterns is a sign nurses needs to watch. If, if the uh, nurses, they don't know, they don't have baseline for residents. For example, some residents, they, they don't sleep at night much anyway. They sleep mostly during the day. If they don't know it, and if they see a resident not sleeping at night, they may uh, have uh, like the alert, uh, which, which is like a false alert. So that's the reason establishing baseline and knowing their a residence is very important. So the time management is also very important because uh, there are time of the day, uh, it, it gets, so the pace is very different in nursing homes for nurses and CNAs. And uh, uh, so they need to know uh, what needs to be done at what time so that they are not uh, stuck during the uh, busy times. And in that sense, task prioritizing is also very common and uh, uh, needs to be done for, for both nurses and uh, CNAs. And uh, uh, one of the CNAs mission is to supporting residents' sense of independence. That's very important for uh, uh, residents' health. And also the, uh, it made a very uh, interruptive environment uh, and the handling interruption is another task they do uh, individual level. So the group level, so the multiple people needs to work together. So the, again, these are mostly individual activities, but these are uh, people needs to do together, like the pain management, uh, assessing and detecting change, treatment, admission, discharge, and incident follow-up. They are typical um, activities conducted mostly uh, nurse CNA pair, but sometimes they get help from others as well. So the, these are mostly accomplished by two people, but sometimes more. So when we look at workflow at organizational level, we observed some time zones. 
And these time zones are typically attached to meal times. So there is a, a morning rush around the breakfast time, and there are things that needs to be done at that time, like the giving morning medication, assisting with uh, getting up. Uh, these are all uh, accomplished in morning time zone. And the second time zone is lunch, uh, like midday medications, uh, serving snacks happen in lunch time. And the dinner time is another time zone, like the uh, evening medications, bedtime preparations. And then the, uh, there is also night zone. So the uh, non-urgent documentation. So a lot of documentation, I was surprised how much documentation happens at night time. Um, and uh, this is interesting because the person uh, conducts activities uh, during the day may be different uh, at night time, but they still uh, do the uh, documentation and they, they have very interesting and strong uh, communication ways uh, to do the documentation right way. So the, when we look at the organizational level, when we conducted observations and the interviews, we were able to see some differences between nursing homes. For example, one nursing home is more centralized. So the um, management is, the proximity of management is uh, more obvious and uh, uh, there is less interdependence between shifts. So it's more role, uh, I'm sorry, rule-based management. Uh, but it is interesting because the physical layout of uh, the place where it's more centralized, it's one story building with long hallways and they have a spoken hub configuration. But the, the uh, nursing home with multiple floor, the, each floor is more autonomous. So that they have their own more rules, so they are more uh, decentralized, they are less centralized. And uh, uh, there are also uh, one thing that took our attention is that they, one of them is using more electronic uh, documentation, the other one is more on paper. So uh, we should also uh, was able to see a lot of interorganization level workflow because um, these residents uh, sometimes they need to go to emergency departments. Uh, they um, sometimes they are monitored daily for some um, like the uh, lipid panels and other uh, things. And they they work with the labs a lot and. Uh, um, as I mentioned before, um, uh, almost all of them are on, on multiple uh, medications, so that they also work closely with uh, pharmacies. So, what is the designer implementation recommendation here? So, the, each time zone that I described has its own pace and responsibilities, and uh, uh, I think it, from the uh, engineering perspective, this gives us. Uh, good clue about how we can organize the work in nursing homes. So the needs and preferences of residents is a driving force. So the nursing homes are really interesting place in a sense that it is semi um, daily living environments because the residents stay there a long time. So it is like almost it's their home, but it is also clinical environment. So the, it is a good intersection of, uh, in that sense, it's very interesting place to study. Um, it is a hybrid place. It is like semi daily living environment and semi uh, clinical environment. And the, so the, their needs and preferences uh, is a driving force. I'm telling this because obviously safety is very important for both nursing homes, but sometimes pace of work and the resident preferences can supersede safety precautions. For example, one example I observed personally was, for um, so that the nurses was in person watch residents taking their medication. So that they, they need to see in order to document that they really took the medication. But there's a one resident was seriously bothered being watched 
while taking the medication. And the nurse was not just watching that specific uh, resident, not to bother, uh, not to bother her, not to bother this uh, resident. So the um, sometimes uh, like the again preferences of residents need some preferences the driving force. Although they they were they were also highly regulated etc. in terms of safety as well. Um, so the it was also obvious I didn't talk much uh, today but. Uh, so these nursing homes, they typically a uh, combination of long-term care facility and skilled nursing facility. So the long-term care patients, they stay there a really long time, sometimes years, multiple years. And the skilled nursing facility, this is like, it's a place patients go there for like at most 90 days. So the, uh, because like the, they don't need to stay in hospital, but they cannot go home. So that they just spent their sometimes weeks, sometimes few months, and then they, they leave. But long-term care patients, they stay there uh, many, many uh, years. And uh, they are different in a sense that obviously establishing baseline for skilled nursing facilities patients, very, it's not easy because they stay there very short time. Uh, but it is relatively easier for long-term care patients, but it is more important for them anyway. So the last case I'm going to talk about is so using the idea of workflow at home. So the, you know the workflow is very industrial term, like the, it's very uh, institutionalized. It's for institutionalized place. But the idea is, can we use workflow for uh, idea of workflow for home to understand daily routines? So what we did is we asked six um, elderly people to keep log for 14 days for us. So the, this is an example a log, uh, for example, from midnight to 6.30, this person was sleeping and then teeth brushing, etc. So the, they kept track of log about 14 days, uh, six people, and then here are some uh, deliverables that we came up. So the, this is, um, this shows like their home and how they move within home uh, during this study period. And the thickness of arrow shows the frequency. So the, obviously the most frequent move was from bedroom to bathroom. And you also see some arrows to outside home uh, that shows this person is leaving home. So the, uh, this is a, a one of the diagrams we came up. So the, what is the value of this though? So the, maybe the value here is not really much if we look at only one time. But if we look at this over time, like six months, and if we see going to bathroom more often, or if we see going to out less, this may be some indicator uh, for frailty or other things that needs to be uh, intervened. So the, I see I have less than 10 minutes, so I'll go a little bit faster. So the, here, what we see here is uh, it's the event flow. This is a software, a research-based software. So the, this compares daily routines of two individuals for us. So the, on the top, one individual, so the green shows sleeping, blue shows waking up. And if you're looking at the second person, this person wakes up typically a little bit later than first person. And then um, this pink shows exercise. So the, this person exercises almost regularly uh, after waking up, but this person exercises more hectic basis throughout two weeks. And the, this purple shows leaving home and this shows coming back. And we also see this person has a little bit more routine life, like with exercise, going out home, etc. But this person has less routine life 
so the, this type of things gives us some comparison across people. And again, one important thing here is if we can come up with these things over time, we can see how people's life change over time that may show, give us clues about mobility and et cetera. So the, the main uh, recommendation here is the visualization of daily routines and context may support patient clinical communication and patient engagement to their care. So main learning from these four cases, workflow studies are resource intensive, yet benefits heavily um, and, or, or, and overweight expense. And then um, there are multiple ways to analyze workflow. I pick cases to show different uh, analysis type uh, and uh, there is no gold standard, single way of do that. And, uh, uh, and I can say consult your workflow researcher uh, to understand what type of methods are best to answer your questions. And then, oh, one interesting thing is that I like one I like thing I like about workflow studies is that sometimes we go there for a purpose, but we observe a bunch of different things. And then we sometimes come up with some, let's say, unintended observations, et cetera, that uh, gives us research question for your next study. So the um, workflow research can definitely benefit from uh, alternative new data sources like sensors and the other things. And again, uh, objective here should be linking workflow to more outcome. And these are my references, and uh, thank you very much. So I hope we still have some time for questions. Thank you so much. It was really interesting, and I really like that you showed examples from different settings, because it's really important to know that it's not just the health systems, like also nursing home and also houses like it's part of the care of patients so i would like to open the floor for questions um see if people have questions you can also put it in the chat anybody has questions i have a couple of questions but just waiting for others uh i have a question hi mina this is claudine sure Go ahead, uh, in, in the uh not the, last, the study of the nursing homes that you uh, you presented and you uh, emphasize that the preference of, of patients, of residents, uh, needed to be uh, prioritized. But did you, did you uh, interview also some of the residents there? Or how did you determine the preference of the residents? So uh, we didn't interview the residents. And then the, actually, uh, what I wanted to say here is, they prioritize the uh, needs and preferences of the residents, uh, but uh, I'm not sure whether this was supposed to happen or not. So the, we, we reported what we observed. And uh, so the, uh, this is what we got from interviewing uh, with the uh, provide, providers there, like most nurses and CNAs, and also when we ask some clarification questions about, you know, the, when we see some safety concerns and et cetera, when we ask it, so that they describe it in a way that, well, this is how they prefer in the long term, this works better for them, et cetera. So that that's how we really concluded that preferences or needs can be prioritized over uh, safety, uh, like the uh, safety guidelines. But we didn't uh, interview any uh, residents, but we did observe a lot of interaction of uh, nurses and CNAs with uh, residents. Great. Uh, we actually have a question in the, sorry, did I interrupt somebody? Oh. We have a question in the chat, um, and Astrid, it was my question to kind of, so the question in the chat is, Please provide examples of how workflow analysis has gone beyond description and been linked to outcomes. And um, I also mentioned, say my question. So I was wondering if what you showed that we do this kind of descriptive analysis and we see that the outcomes of patients change after, can that be interpreted as the impact of workflow on outcomes? So two main questions. 
Uh, can you provide examples of how workflow analysis has gone beyond description and been linked to outcomes? That's the first one. And my question is, if we see that the outcomes change over six months, is that something that we can interpret or are we looking into quantitative analysis? So, uh, so the one example I uh, explain a little bit was to linking work law in emergency department to length of stay. So the workflow is like an um, uh, array, like a sequence, and the length of stay is a number. So the, can we come up with some mathematical uh, operations that allow us to correlate uh, sequence to a number? So the, another example can be, so the, what, one thing we are currently working on is that, can we identify uh, some patterns, emergency pattern, workflow patterns in emergency departments that is linked to desired asthma outcomes, like uh, early returns, again, length of stay, or uh, type of thing. So the, that's currently what we are working right now, linking tabs conducted, but as a whole. So the, the one key point of uh, workflow studies is that the unit of analysis is typically is a, is a array, is a, a chain of events. So the, can we identify patterns of these chain events that can be linked to desired asthma outcomes in emergency department or not. Again, the asthma outcomes can be uh, early returns, uh, length of stay, or admission, like the whether this person is admitted uh, or we were able to take this person, we were able to discharge the person home. So the, these are uh, the cases we are currently working right now. So uh, could you repeat the second question? Mina, uh, yeah. I, I already forgot it. Yeah, I think you kind of answered that, that um, I think if we look at workflow as an intervention, we, look can, we can look at before and after and see, for example, if the number of falls has been reduced. But that's kind of can be a, even, I'm gonna say, causal relation between what was before and what was after the workflow. And that can be interpreted as an impact and outcome. That's true, that's true. So the interesting enough, my research has never led me to come up with a workflow intervention. We always use workflow kind of to, um, to capture what is going on there and mm -hmm. to evaluate other type of interventions. But you are right, workflow itself, like the changing the workflow can be also uh, an, an intervention. Any other questions we have? Well, oh, sorry, sorry, this one, yeah. Another I have question. another question, in fact, a, a follow-up question to what you just said, Dr. Oskenak. So do you know, from the studies that you've done, do you know whether, and when you, when you, uh, prop, when you uh, submitted your results, when you uh, gave the results to the stakeholders, do you know whether they made any modifications in their workflow then? Uh, that's that's a great question. That's so the when we co co conduct observations and interviews, we always go back, and the, this is what we understand your workflow is. What do you think? And I would say um, there are definitely some changes. They are um, not, not necessarily major changes, but uh, that's so the, that typically happens. So when we talk to some person and then show it to other person as well. The other person, wow, is it really the case? Or is it really what happens? So the, we definitely do that. We always, when we, so the, that's always our part of research protocol. We don't do it with when we collect data from more objective resources such as EHR, but when we do observations and the interview, we always go back. And then sometimes we got some, uh, uh, like the ch they challenge us sometimes again for two reasons. One time is maybe we interpret it is not good enough, and the second one is again sometimes we capture 
how they perceive workflow is. And then the, um, when we collect data from multiple people, what we get uh, eventually may be different than a single person, what single person thinks workflow is. But that's a great question. Thank you for giving the opportunity to tell me about this. Thank you so much. It was great. I Thank really you. appreciate it. And if uh, the audience have more questions, you can certainly reach out to Dr. Skynek. And uh, thank you so much for the presentation. We really enjoyed it. And see you all um, next week. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.